You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hello, friends. Did you know that I write personalized songs? That's right. I'd love to write a one of a kind custom song for you, a friend, loved one, co worker, significant other, or anyone else. Makes a great gift for anniversaries, birthdays, graduations, holidays, or any other momentous occasion. I also write and record jingles for businesses, brands, or podcasts. Please email me at kristamakes at gmail.com for more info. I look forward to writing you or that special someone a song that will last a lifetime. Hey, rude boys and rude girls, have we got a good one for you today. My friends Dickie Barrett and Joe Gittleman from the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones drop by to discuss their breakout hit single, The Impression That I Get, taken from their 1997 album, Let's Face It. Dickie shares the very personal inspiration behind the lyrics and the song's inception. Joe takes us back to their humble rehearsal space in Boston, where the song was initially crafted, and surprisingly explains to me that, at the time, it just felt like another song in their repertoire. I brought up the fact that an old manager of mine told me a story about the song's meaning that I always believed to be true, and as it turns out, she wasn't too far off. And we dive into the brand new Boston single, The Final Parade, taken from their upcoming new studio album that features the who's who of the ska community. For all this and more, grab your pork pie hat and dust off that suit. We'll see you on the dance floor. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. You know, I was trying to put together an intro for you guys this morning. I don't even know how, where I would start to introduce Dickie Barrett and Joe Gittleman from the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones from a personal standpoint. For my listeners, I'm sure 99.9% of you know who the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones are. I am super stoked to have you guys on the show today. And uh, Dickie and Joe have agreed to break down the impression that I get. And we're also, at the end of the episode, later on, we're going to talk about their brand new single that I was fortunate enough to be featured on and uh, very excited about it the final parade ah yes we're gonna break these down but we got to leave time to put them back together we can't just leave them heaped on the floor (laughs) no (laughs) we don't want to do that we don't we don't want to do that the impression that i get uh released on the record let's face it on march 11th 1997 Produced by uh, Paul Coldery and Sean Slade, and this was your fifth full-length record. Band was formed in 1983. First record, Devil's Night Out, was in 89. I first heard that record in 1990. You guys uh, toured at that point more than any band. That You were just a total blueprint for what Less Than Jake wanted to do. Uh, I saw you probably a dozen times before we got on the 97 Warp Tour, when Impression was blowing up. So between Question the Answers in 1994 and uh, 1997, when Let's Face It was released, do you guys remember when Impression was written? I remember writing Impression shortly before the record came out, I guess, you know, within a year's time of before the record came out, me and, me and uh, Joe got together. And Joe had the music and I had some lyrics and, and we, it was at a time where you couldn't, you know, send files to each other or you, yeah. you had to be in the same room and you walked away maybe with a, with a boom box cassette that you tried to write to at home. And I, yeah, I can remember that. I remember writing the lyrics at a friend's brother's funeral and, and we were at, at their house in Canton, Massachusetts. And I was sitting on the porch and it was, and it was a young guy, very young guy, maybe two years older than me. And, and he uh, passed away young. And the family was just devastated, as you would well imagine. And, and um, so I started writing the lyrics then, kind of, you know, trying to undo the Rubik's Cube that is loss and pain and, and the th- things like that. And, and, you know, what it meant to me and what it, what it meant to the family and what I was witnessing. So... Um, put together these lyrics i didn't want them to be too much but i didn't want them to not say anything and it was more poetry than anything else and then it was time to make a record and i and i said well i have these and we started working on it you know joe can jump in at any time but so many different things were going on at that time we were sort of being challenged 
up until then we had been making like anti song records like if it if it felt too much like a like a song or what's been done in the past then we would scrap it or if we were if we were had a good groove going we'd say all right and enough of that enough of that let's kick somebody in the balls and you know <laughs> that's sort of what the punk sky thing was all about it was you know with well little lull people into a false sense of security and then hit them over the head with something we love songwriting we love songs but that we felt we could fuck them up better than we could <laughs> at that at an early age better than we could actually make them so then we just felt challenged we, we were like People are letting us do this. We're, we're making records. People are coming to see us play. And they're calling us songwriters. So let's maybe get a little bit serious. So, so that sort of was going on at the same time. At that, you know, when we started to write, let's face it. There was a new president at the record label that we, we ended up on. And it was Danny Goldberg, who, who's known for, for Nirvana and managing Nirvana and, and you know, so, sort of legendary in, in the industry. And he challenged me and he said, you, you know, you're afraid to make a good record and you're afraid to make good songs. Wow. And, and he knew he knew where to hit me because to this day, you know, being afraid is just this is not in my vocabulary. And, and he was, you know, and he kept saying that to me. And I, you know, I gave him a bunch of fuck yous and I'm not afraid of anything. Then I thought about it and the other guys in the band were anxious to start writing songs that, that, you know, in, the, in a more traditional sense. So that's what we were doing. And, and it was a little bit awkward, like walking in mud at first and going, uh, uh, you know, like so many things at that time is like people like the ska music all of a sudden turning into death metal. So you know should we change that formula who knows but then we started to get into it and started to enjoy it and, and i'm joking tell you i'm an insane fan of like radio gold and and all the hits of the 70s and and songs are always kind of been really important to me so that's what we we're doing joe you still there i'm here i'm here Dan. <laughs> Am I boring you? I'm just listening. I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning. I, am, I am too. Take take it away, Dickie. This is great. Anyway, so a lot of the stuff I wrote was very wordy. It was word gymnastics or, or word salad where it would just the words would just keep coming at you. And I love that. And I, and, I, and I thought that that's what I did the best was was writing words and putting words together. And I felt like a word blacksmith. I'd hammer this word in there and go, oh, wow. And that was what I had to offer because they, they were really getting good through all the road work. And, and you mentioned the road work, and that was all Joe. Joe just figured that out and stuffed us all in a van, and off we went and, you know, never came home. They were getting, you know, great at it and really, really good. But my if I called myself mediocre, people would debate that singer. But I knew that I could put words together, and that's what it was offering. Basically, long story short, Dick and I have been trying to figure out ways to run from real life for a long time now, and <laughs> and that is, a lot of that has come down to come come down to writing songs. Yeah. you know, <laughs> if we had to write songs, we then we will. What do we got to do? Yeah. Well, I got to jump in here. You know, your your first four records, and if you include if you include uh, Scott Core, the Devil, and more, the EP, you know, your first five records, it was just boom, boom. It was 89, 91, 92, 93, 94. Uh, then, of course, you guys stuffed in the Lollapalooza tour in 95. There was a lot going on. So, you know, this was your longest gap between records up to that point, 94 to 97. Joe, do you remember your initial reaction when you saw the lyrics from Dickie, what, what you thought of them? Good question. You know, uh... I can remember very clearly in the studio the first time he he that that sort of that scream into the chorus came in. <laughs> yeah. Like that that was something that really changed changed the song for me. You know, I I will say though, just from my end, just on the composing on the music side of it and the melodies and and the bits that I kind of you know little whistling things that I brought to the table um, with Dick. That intro, you know, when I was that that guitar lick for the intro of impression i didn't really realize at the time it took me a while but i knew i was trying to kind of figure out something that that actually is is only a chord or two away from um a pachelbel canon in d that wedding kind of chord progression yeah That was a he was a, a German-born composer Johann Pachelbel, 
in the 1600s. I know that, Joe. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, well, we did the yeah. we did the warp tour with him. We did the warp tour with him <laughs> early on. He wasn't on the main stage, but he was there. I, I check him out. He was, he was the bar- barbecue band. I think it was the barbecue yeah. band. I know this stuff, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, it's a it's a it's a song that is very commonly played. It's a formal song played at weddings. Perhaps listeners of this podcast will remember it from uh, "Dude, Where's My Car." It was also <laughs> you can also see it in there. Does anybody ever remember the, the sequel to "Dude's Where's Where's My Car"? Seriously, dude, where's my car? <laughs> Is there any chance you guys would ever make a sequel? There, there's a script for it. There is actually a script. It's called Seriously, Dude, Where's My Car? (laughs) Which is the appropriate title. That's the perfect sequel title. It's just, we've just never, it's never got home yet. It just hasn't gotten to a place where, like, people are like, yeah, let's make it. Right, right. I mean, I I would do it. What I remember, Joe, is when we, and I say about the studio, and I don't mean the recording studio, I mean our practice space. And we were sitting down, and, you know, we wanted to write simpler choruses, but I just couldn't. I couldn't scale down that chorus. And you were like, you know, can't you just have it come up with like, you know, three or four words, come up with one solid message, and then we'll repeat that. And I couldn't do it like that. Never had to knock on wood, how it just kept, the words just kept coming at you. And then it kind of soured me on the song. And then I'm like, ah, which, you know, until it started blowing up, I I was so unsure of it, you know? And an interesting thing, you mentioned that scream. That scream was Paul Coldry and Sean Slade had just had some success with that song "Creep" by Radiohead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know that guitar noise that yeah. sets up the cho- sets yeah. up the chorus. They got really excited about it. And they go, "Oh, good, we have something to set up the chorus like Creep." So that scream is sort of the, you know, the trick that they did twice, you know, that that guitar (laughs) noise and my scream are the same sort of, here comes the chorus. Well, but your your scream was so you. It's so boss tones, and I, I just got, I I just have to say right now that you know the '90s were a big time. Uh, you know, cries of sellout if you signed to a major label, if you got on the radio, and you know I'm sure you guys might have dealt with some of that. But I'm telling you the honest truth. I don't recall one person in the scene that I knew that ever had a bad thing to say about you when this song hit. We we were all proud of you. You guys were. Gods do us. You still are. You're the godfathers of ska punk. And it's like, ah, thank you. No. And it's like, when this song hit, you couldn't cry sellout. This was just the, to me, like a, <laughs> this was a, this was a sister, uh, sibling or, you know, brother or sibling song to, to something like Someday I Suppose. I come back to me and find it. Maybe I will. I should write down a reminder. What? It was just the next step up from that. I mean, that song was a ra- to me was a radio hit. Uh, it felt but- that way, but we still, we still that and and you know, with the one-two punch of that and Clueless, it was like we were almost challenging people to call us sellouts. But the fact of the matter remained is we did what we wanted, exactly what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it, and that was just the natural progression. That's what we were. That's where we were headed, and that continues. You know, to be quite honest with you, right? But it's 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 just remarkable that you know, ten plus years into your career, that this happens, and it's just it just goes to show you. I mean, how much road work you guys did, how much time you put. You played. I saw you in hole in the wall dives to arenas to everything in between up to this point, and you just you put in the work. You played with us in hole in the wall dives. I remember Janice <laughs> Landing. That was like yeah. early nineties, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, August 13th, 1994. <laughs> it was so cool. That that was such a cool show and such an incredible place. Your scene and, and everybody there and, and the Janice Landing people, it was 
it was great. Yeah, we had to beg uh, Tony Refugiato, who's known as Daddy Cool, the promoter down there. We had to beg him to get on that show. And actually, a local Tampa band, Maga Dog, had the show, and they had to drop off last minute, and he gave me a call. That was our first big break, was getting in front of your crowd that night. And I'll never forget it, and I, I owe you guys a... I, it was, a I, I felt like it was your crowd. Uh, well, we we have maybe had some fans <laughs> there, but that was that was the biggest biggest thing we had ever done, and it was we'll never forget it. I want to jump into the song now and talk about that intro guitar riff. Is just in terms of a ska song, that riff is just it's iconic. It's a twenty second intro. At some point, the band jumps in with just one of the catchiest horn lines ever. just makes you want to dance and we come into the first verse and the lyric is have you ever been close to tragedy or been close to folks you have have you ever felt a pain so powerful so heavy you collapse no well and then there's the big eye the scream. big the, the big scream yeah. <laughs> and uh, so if you can set up that first verse of you know I know you had mentioned that your, your friend had passed away but I, this is just what you were feeling on the porch that day you know, by the time you get to me, you, you've already got cavities. There's so many hooks and so, so much. The horn part would be enough to start a song. The guitar part would be enough. I mean, Joe just was relentless. And, he, and, and that's why, you know, it's almost a talking verse, you know, it would, which is I'm more than capable of doing. But uh, everything that introduces it is so melodic and props to my buddy who writes like that and and it was by the time you hit that it was you know i could say anything and 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 we were, we were off to the races but the uh first verse is more personal on an individual that's what my friend my high school and long time still friend brian was going through and, and, and at that time his own personal loss the second verse is more universal and has to do more with our generation you know of us you know being able to be a ska band and load into a to a van in the nineties and things where, you know, and then now, I mean, I guess now is the answer to that question, you know, is, it, you know, the, the state of the world now, maybe, maybe there's never been anything like this before. And this is our challenge, you know, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to jump in and, and mention, we were, we were really aware of the fact that we were lucky to be able to do what we were doing, you know, and like we were, cr we were crossing into Canada to play Foon Foon Electric, like when the Iraq war was starting, you know what I mean? And we were in right. our early twenties at that point, early to mid twenties. So, you know, we were definitely aware that like there are other people who are sacrificing more than us. And we were just kind of, you know, we kind of were, were aware that we were just guys playing music, you know, and that other people had, had faced a lot more than we had, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd also like to talk about this first verse, well, through the whole song, but I've mentioned it on this show before, when you can hear a song within a song, and I got to give you props, Joe, that bass line is just, <laughs> it is, it is so good. It's just, it's a, I can, I can zone into just that bass part and get off on that without even listening to the rest of the song. It is, it's, it's, it's awesome, man. Never been close to tragedy, I've been close to folks who have. Ever felt the pain so powerful, so heavy you collapse. Right on, thank you. Somebody broke down the song one time on, on, a, on a show where they just kind of took played track by track, the different tracks. And then and it, when it got to the bass line, I was like, oh my God. You know, it does definitely completely stand on its own. But for me, and being able to, having worked with Joe for a long time, there's so many of his bass lines that do just that. So, mm -hmm. and when you tip, you know, a lot of times when you have bass lines that busy and other uh, genres of music, they'll step on the vocal. You can you can get away with it if it's a great bass line uh, in ska more often than other genres for whatever reason. And this bass line just sits there and it doesn't fight the vocal. It doesn't fight what the band's doing. It's it's, yeah. it's so it's so great. I mean, I, I think that's also about the vocal. You know, those chords are moving fast. They're not staying in, in, put very long. The bass is doing a lot, but that vocal melody really is just sort of, you know, built around a few notes, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, too, if you have a vocalist that you actually want to step on, then it, <laughs> that's helpful, too. Well, that's, you know... I wouldn't want to step on you, Dick, but... but uh, <laughs> Thank you. Something I noticed when I was uh, dissecting the song, at 38 seconds, this is quick, you're into this first chorus. And yeah, there's a lot of info here. There's a lot of words, but 
I don't know if you could have scaled this back. I, you know, I can't see this being anything but it was. And the lyric is, I've never had to knock on wood, but I know someone who has, which makes me wonder if I could. It makes me wonder if I've never had to knock on wood and I'm glad I haven't yet because I'm sure it isn't good. That's the impression that I get. And I'll never forget Less Than Jake's first manager. You know, she had told me that this song was about abortion. And for years, I thought that that's what it was. And I, up until probably today, I just was, I, I never was for certain of that, but I never heard another explanation of this song. You know, never had to knock on wood. I hope my girlfriend's not pregnant type of thing. So uh, to hear you talk about the song now is just funny to me. For 25 years, my old manager was, couldn't have been more wrong. But that line, I've never, I've never had well, to knock on wood. No, not really. The, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Okay. So maybe she was on, maybe she was onto something. Well, here's the story is when we, when we released it initially, it was for a benefit compilation that we were involved in putting out. There had been some shootings at women's health care facilities, uh, a women's health care facility in, in the Boston area. And so this compilation was called Safe and Sound. It came out before Let's Face It. And um, that's actually like that, that we put out that compilation and the song started to get, get played there. I remember the label got mad at us. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? It's like, we didn't know. And I think that kind of is testimony to the fact that I had, had been sort of soured. There's some other good songs on that, let's face it, record. So to me, I'd sort of lean towards, you know, you know, one to eight or some, some yeah. of those kind. So I didn't know about Impression. I fe- and it also felt so personal. Uh, a lot of people, too, think that, the, you know, it's the 90s, too, so that the tested part, I've never been tested, was about AIDS testing getting an AIDS test at the time. And, uh, and, and, and I didn't ever, if someone said, Oh, you know, it's about, you know, women's healthcare rights. And, and I never said, no, it's not. Uh, or, or in the same thing with, you know, HIV or, or AIDS, if someone said, you know, if it meant something to somebody who was suffering that way, then, then I, I never took that away from anybody either. So, Yeah, that's, that's an interesting perspective because you don't want to... <laughs> it's supposed to mean something to, you know, whatever it means to you, it means to you. And I, I wouldn't want to be so arrogant as to say, you know, it, it only means this. So, Gotcha. Well, after the first chorus, we come back into just the band reintro that was at the top with the, with the reintro of the horn line. Just so catchy we get into verse number two have you ever had the odds stacked up so high you need a strength most don't possess or has it ever come down to do or die you've got to rise above the rest no well and then the scream again and (laughs) so set up this verse that verse i i wanted to get i wanted to get rise above in it and for black flag so I, I wrote <laughs> nice. I, nice. I, I promise you that's the truth. I wanted to get that in there, and then I wrote the rest of it. Rise above, you know, like what did rise above mean to me, and what does, you know, and, and had I ever risen above anything? And when I start writing lyrics and I start putting things, I, I think of other people's lyrics and what that, you know, were important lyrics to me. And then, you know, so I, I guess you could say I, I stole Rise Above and having nothing to do with anything that Black Flag was saying. And then, and then I built around that. But in fairness, it comes down to do or die. Ken Casey stole that from me and named his first record. <laughs> Do or die. The dropkick <laughs> Murphy's old Ken Casey comes to the yeah. st- stole your lyric. He told me that on on the thread one time. <laughs> uh, we get into chorus number two. Same lyrics as chorus number one. And then there's an eight second musical interlude that only happens for this this part, which is now the bridge. And then there's uh, 10 seconds, which is basically the bridge is the intro guitar chords and it's a breakdown. And the lyric is, I'm not a coward. I've just never been tested. I like to think that if I was, I would pass. Look at the tested and think there. But for the grace, go I might be a coward. I'm afraid of what I might find out. Yeah, I love that lyric. Thank you. Talk about that. That's just, it just works so well. It's saying what I had said earlier is I'm, I, I know I'm not afraid, but then it kind of, it, it flips back to 
well, have I ever really had anything to be afraid of? And, and I also, you know, cocky, arrogant, you know, Boston guy. Belly full of booze. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> high as a kite <laughs> and just feeling it. No. Uh, Hi, podcast listeners. I'm Carol Costello, a former CNN anchor and national correspondent. This January, I'm launching a podcast about one of the first cases I ever covered as a journalist. It's one that stuck with me all of these years, the one that buried itself under my skin and stayed put. It's a true crime series about an amazing woman named Phyllis Cottle, who defied torture and death and brought a fierce rage to the quest to find her attacker. Carol Costello Presents Blind Rage is a production of Evergreen Podcasts and signature title of the Killer Podcast Network. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Discover more great true crime and paranormal programming at KillerPodcast.com. And, and I thought, you know, that, that there were few challenges if, if presented to me that I couldn't handle. But the truth of the matter is, in, in, in my more quieter and, and more kind of reflective moments, or, or I guess I just really don't know. And you don't know until you are, until it is. You know, so you can go around saying, yeah, bring it on. But, um, you know, you don't know until you know or until it happens. So so that that's what I was sort of saying. It was it's sort of head, lyrically hedging your bets. And, and um, at the same time, you know, being honest, I think just being honest that you really don't know. You know, yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I would assess here. This this is this to me is an honest lyric. And I love that line. Number I feel like one. I was dishonestly being honest. <laughs> <laughs> I love how I love how line number one says I'm not a coward, and the start of line four says might be a coward. So you're questioning <laughs> you're, you're questioning yourself there, and that that's what I love about the lyric. Yeah, well, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is difficult podcast because all the things you're saying mean a lot because you're not a chump. <laughs> you know? I, thank you're, you. You're a guy that's you're a guy that's done it, you know, and been there. Yeah, well, I appreciate so thank you. that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, I noticed that when we come out of the, the bridge, you say what I might find out, and there's no scream. It just launches right back in to the third chorus. Yeah. Was there ever talk about a scream being there or to set that up or never talked about? I don't think we ever talked about that. I think I had trouble putting those lyrics in. I, I didn't have time for a scream. I was trying <laughs> to um, <laughs> rhythmically get that part down couple of quick questions so at what point you're in the rehearsal uh, space in boston you got the band in there the, the horn sections fired up they got their part and was this just another song on the record at that point another another one in the bunch or did you ever feel at that point we have something here it was honestly chris it was it was in the maybe pile for a long time to be honest with you wow no yeah. kidding we wrote a lot of songs for that record that's true and and, uh, and there was there was um the scream too, good to go backwards a little bit. The scream too could have been out of you know frustration and and like, you know where where is you know it might be the last of my great screams. People to this day go, oh, there's not enough Dickie's monster voice on on the Boston's record. But I, <laughs> you know, I, I felt like I made enough of those records that I I sort of wanted to start doing something a little different. But the scream was sort of like, ah. A little bit out of frustration in, in the in the process of of it all. Well, and what the fans don't realize is you still have to scream uh, fifteen to sixteen to twenty times during a live show. So, <laughs> <laughs> I know the uh, that too. I was trying to make my work a little bit easier. The um, ending part, if to, if not to move this too fast on you, that was mocking the horn part towards the end. The saxophone all of a sudden starts playing this sort of different melodic idea, and then mm -hmm. and then I sort of mock I sort of mocked that in a way that everybody liked. I love that part. We'll, we'll talk about this real quick, and then I have, have one more question about uh, what Paul and Sean, the producers, thought, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But third chorus, same as the other choruses, then it has the reintro again. The reintro horn part comes in, and there's the sax that, that, that Dick was talking about just now. It comes in playing the chorus melody. gives me gives me chills every time i hear it and then it breaks down the b3 organ comes in and 
but I haven't yet. That's the impression that I get. And it's almost got this <laughs> hymnal church vibe that just takes over this beautiful. And this is unlike anything you guys had done at this point. The ending of this song, how did that come together? Because it's a really odd way to end a song that's this heavy, but it works on an epic level. That's that's a good question. It's one of those kind of magic studio sort of moments where it was maybe we hadn't thought of how we were going to end it. Right. And then um, we probably sent Kevin in and said, you know, what do you got? And he, and he laid that well, down. Well, that's the, sa- that's the same part from the top. So it's the same horn horn part from the top, just sort of played one guy, a little bit different feeling, you know? So A little more soulful. I, I, agree, I agree with Dickie completely. It, it's likely that we just kind of played on. I mean, if you were to really pull it apart and listen, the bass gets flipped around. It's playing the wrong chords yeah. on top. It's played the inver- inverted kind of chord progression, totally unintentional. You know, either a mistake from doing the overdubs or just like we tracked it and didn't notice that. Um, I think is a was a was sort of special thing, but it very well in, in today's day and age might have been something where we just edited that, made it shorter that end or something. But we're working on tape at that point, so right. when, you're, when you when you record to tape that way, you're kind of like a little bit more married to those decisions, and so the length of the song is a little bit more fixed. And so then your 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 t- conversations go to how are you going to use that space? And so like Dickie says, you know, hey, but let's bring back that little lick from the top, you know, and then Dickie Dickie added those extra lyrics sort of in the same kind of melody and and then the whole thing just just went away you know in, in today's day and age we might have cut it cut that and made it shorter or something well it and it's just it's so personal that last line the way that you just say and it, you're just kind of talking that's the impression that i get it just it feels so personal like you're in the room listening to somebody talk that that to you speak that to you it's it's such a great way to end a song when you brought the song to Paul Coldery and Sean Slade, the producers. What did they think of it? And as you were building the track, was there any excitement at that point or was it still just uh, another song? <laughs> if you know, if you know <laughs> Paul and Sean, there's very rarely excitement about anything. I mean, they <laughs> don't get me wrong. They enjoy working on music and, and I mean, they've made their lives around it and they're super talented musicians. By the way, that organ at the end, that would be Sean Slade, I, I would imagine. At that point, Dick, probably, it was probably, right? yeah, because yeah. that was before we started playing with Aronoff and that stuff, I think. So I think that was Sean Slade. He, you know, he played some organ. They had been in some cool bands in Boston in the 80s. Uh, the Sex Execs was a band that yeah. Paul and Sean went in. <laughs> Super talented guys. <laughs> But they, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't fly too high or too low. You know, they're like a lot of producers. They, they, they ride it and kind of keep it even because you got to get a lot of work done. You know. Yeah, they're really they're good like that, and then sometimes it gets frustrating where you think you do something incredible and there's just sort of a a, a flat line coming at you, and you're like, mm-hmm. which which keeps you grounded and and th- and things in perspective. But but uh, I think that they work hard, and but you know. I think they might not even to this day know it ever was on the radio. <laughs> no, they know. Believe me, Dick, they know. Oh, they do. All right. <laughs> you get the record mixed. You're driving around, I'm assuming, listening to a cassette at this point. That's what we did in the 90s. And you're listening to the record in context. Did it at any point before the label took this to radio, did it at any point hit you that, okay, there's this, this song's magic? Yeah, you know, th- there was an event when we were finishing the mix. We were at the Magic Shop in New York, mm-hmm. and at that, at, at toward the end, the label like brought some people in, like they invited people into the studio to listen to our record or whatever. And you know, we had never really been in that position before. Um, and <laughs> that, that uh, well, no one wanted to hear it, but uh, you know, we played the record for people, and, and I think after that, there was a little bit more of a you know, our our A and R, Allison Hamamura was a little bit more focused on that after that event that we had at the magic shop. So it was like radio people and, and, you know, program directors and press people and like maybe 50, 75 people. And, um, they responded. Do you remember playing the track live before the record came out? I do because I'll tell you why I remember that because we were playing with, um, Spring Hill Jack so much that they started to 
put that lick into their song, like the horns <laughs> part. Like this was like months before the record came out. Like they started, they started like yeah. comping that lick, that that little lick. So I know that we played it around New England. Fucking Pete. It was probably Pete, right? Yeah. Well, for, that for, asshole. For those that don't know, <laughs> Spring Hill Jack, uh, Pete Wazalewski, we call him Jr. and less than Jake. He played sax in Spring Hill Jack, and of course, Mr. Chris Rhodes, our. Uh, honorary member of less than jake we love him to death he's a trombone player of course in the boss tones they were in spring Hill jack and i didn't know that they ripped off your song those bastards <laughs> <laughs> it was all in good fun yeah, yeah yeah well i just remember um you know march the record came out that summer we were on the warp tour with you guys our first time ever doing it we did uh, two and a half three weeks up the east coast and it was just incredible. The song was blowing up that summer. It was everywhere and just such a such a great sing along. And and like I said, I, I can't recall one person having any issue. It was just it was undeniably boss tones. You guys did not change a damn thing about who you were. And all of us fans knew years before any of those label execs and all the number crunching idiots at the labels. We knew what what was special about this band yeah. and and it happened for you guys i'd like to get in now to uh to the new record and uh the, the brand new single the final parade Uh, released on January 25th of, of this year, 2021. Uh, the track is from your new record that's going to be, uh, or is on Hellcat Records. And uh, I think Tim Armstrong produced the song, correct? Yes. Along with Ted Hutt, they were co-producers on the project. Okay, yeah. and Ted Hutt's been a longtime producer of you guys. Mm -hmm. Great. So <laughs> You think it's fair, Joe, to say that Tim and, and Rancid probably had a lot to do with the album let's face it being what it was as well i'd say so wouldn't you say yeah having heard out come the wolves it was like we we realized okay it's it's not a crime to make good sounding songs so it, and be a songwriter and 30 years later we end up working with the guy and as joe mentioned producer ted hot too well this song tell tell me about this the, an eight minute ska song is ambitious to say the least so <laughs> how, how did, did the song stupid. just keep growing or what what how, how this whole thing begin <laughs> when, when you invite you know 40 or 50 guests to a party there's got to be enough room so uh so for starters you know we got there's half a dozen guys from your band in there Yes, yeah, we got we got me me uh, me Jr. and Roger, of course, got Jimmy G from Murphy's Law, Toby Morrison, Rusty from H two O, John Feldman from Goldfinger, uh, Dan Vital from Bim Scala Bim, Dave from Big D and the Kids Table, uh, Amy Interrupter, Tim Armstrong. The list goes on and on. It's just the who's who. Amy Interrupter of, and all the interrupters. Yes, uh, it, it's it's the it's the who's who of ska. So was the track ever like a three minute song? Just a, just a tune you wrote that that it became this animal that it is. The track could have been two three-minute songs that we we <laughs> Frankenstein together. It could it could have been a lot of things. One of the things when you're going in the studio, likely you can relate to this, Chris. When producers want to cut, you know, well, no more than X number of songs are we going to take into the studio with us. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And so it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a of an attempt to get two songs. Disguised as one. <laughs> on the We're record. really pulling back the curtain here. <laughs> it's like you guys entered into your uh, your Russian dream theater uh, prog rock phase. One of the guys looked at me, said, "He's like, well, my song is going to make the record. Calm down. I've got an idea. I've got an idea. Hold on. <laughs> we'll do it. But there can only be thirteen. So don't worry. I'll get Tattoo it in there." To, to answer your question, though, your original question, it did grow when, you know, w when we're waiting to see who's going to uh, accept our invite to participate and what files we're going to get back and what people are going to sing and what they're going to send us and all that kind of stuff had us. I mean, really, it was it, it was the Rubik's Cube of our whole session. You know, it was the thing that required the most work at the end. It was the thing that needed the most work. And, you know, it was right up crunch time. There were people that we wish we, we could have gotten tracks from. But ultimately, um, ride or die with our squad. It was so cool that everyone was willing to participate. And it's uh, it's been a really fun thing. So cool. I mean, the, it made us emotional at some points that people were like, you, you know, not just 
should I jump and how high and, you know, a testimony to the, to the friendships we've made and the people that we've decided to call our friends throughout the years of, of doing the Mighty Mighty Boston's. And, and when I s say that, I certainly speak of you and less than Jake. But uh, the, at one point, Tim came in and he laid the whole thing out and it was, it was uh, and this will make you feel better, it was a 15-minute song. What? That, <laughs> yes. He just kept, had it going and going. It was... You know, and, and I let him do it, and then I'm like, we can't, Tim, yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Good impression. <laughs> uh, well, I mean. That's the impression that you get. <laughs> I, certainly. I, I, I can't, for the life of me, think of many, I mean, there may have been some old dance hall reggae ska stuff that was just jams that went on for that long. That's uh, what but, we wanted it to be was something that once you hit the dance floor, so many times, you, you know, this not me, but but maybe Ben <laughs> would, be, would be out there dancing and he just wants to keep going. And, and I think that that's what we wanted, old school kind of moon stomp and just, you know, then this comes in, then the whoa and this and this giving you reason to, to want to stay out there and just and have it. You know, it's, the it's, metamorphosis <laughs> takes place is, you know, I think that the one thing Joe said to me one time, he's like, he was reading comments and stuff of people, what people were saying about the song. And he said, you know, the, the biggest complaint is it's not long enough. And and I think that that, that was pretty made you feel good for, for sure. No, there were, I went down uh, reading comments last night on YouTube. They were just just so much love, so much outpouring from just your fan base, the Scott community in general. And it's funny you mentioned Ben Carr. I have it in my notes here. I, I was thinking he's going to have to pull an oxygen tank around when you go into the song. And thank God it's not 15 <laughs> minutes. It's only eight. You kill poor Ben. <laughs> we'll do it in the encore. We'll give him a break and then head out. <laughs> Final break. Here we go, Ben. So was this in, in your in your minds just a great way to, to set up the record by launching it? As, no. It's, a, it, it's an ambitious first single. Well, you know, you know what? It was my idea to, to put it out there first, but I have to say, the way it came together, I always imagined there would be some element of this record that would be like kind of a community record, you know? And, and I think about a lot of the stuff that Tim's done with Tim Timebomb and friends and stuff, and like it always brings a cool energy when you inject someone, you know, unexpected into the mix, you know? And then. Uh, we were in the studio and, and I had an interest or we had it. We, we weren't going to get out of that studio without Tim singing something on this record. That was for damn sure. And that was what he, that was what he wanted to sing on. And that just opened up conversations about like, well, who, what else could we do with it? You know, it was just sort of like, we, we sat there in the studio for probably a half hour, just like mapping it out, writing, you know, uh, the arrangement. What we did know is because of the, because of the quarantine, we knew that people had really good, you know, set up equipment to record at home. We knew that, that, you know, no one was like, oh, I don't have, except for me was I don't have the proper <laughs> equipment. Do you, I know you can't uh, talk about the name of the record yet. Do you have a release date? And not, do you know? It's, it's uh, getting sorted, sorted out. Getting sorted out. We, we're not, we can't even say whether we have a record. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, ask, I, will, I will ask this. Is, is this the longest song on the new album? No, that's the shortest one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They didn't do a double album. Did a, you did a triple album. <laughs> yeah. We were calling that song In Escada de Vida, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. So, uh, guys, I want to, at this point, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to to talk to me. Uh, the listeners are going to just uh, love this. You, you opened up about impression. I learned a ton about the song. Uh, meant everything, obviously, that I, that I said about it. Congratulations on the final parade. Congratulations on still doing this at the level that, that you're doing it. Is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners uh, uh, with uh, outside of what we talked about? Dickie, should we sing them a little something that we've been <laughs> trying to do something? Can we Get go to the phones? <laughs> Can we go to the phones? We got yeah, Jim sorry. on line four. Yeah, go for Jim. I don't know. How, I don't know. What, I don't. I don't have much to say except that we're really looking forward to seeing people. Hopefully, someday soon. You know, I, it's it's nice to see you. You know, we're lucky to have had this project to work on together. It was a crazy time to try and do something, and, and we kind of were lucky to put together the, a cool team of people, like the right team of people that, you know, it was just, I feel like we made made something of, of a, a shitty situation, and so on that level, I'm, I'm happy, and 
um, just like people to know that we hope to see you soon and we, we miss you. Being able to connect with other musicians, um, many of whom are my friends, it makes me feel like I'm still out there doing it because it's been very strange being a touring musician not to be out there and just not to not to be some a social guy. I like to hang out and talk to my friends. So I, I totally relate mm-hmm. to totally relate to what you just said. Yeah, big time. It's great to see you, man. Great to see you too. Thank you guys so much for being on. Thanks, bud. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living. And every week, I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com, and I'll see you there. As we near the end of the show... Here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is submit your song and bio to bandyoumightnotknow at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is the Milwaukee, Wisconsin-based ska band Something To Do. They just released their fifth full-length album, Give Me Attention, and you can find them on Facebook and their music on Bandcamp. Here's a snippet of their song, I Know Something That They Don't Know. I know something that they don't know when it's you are someone who's The Rap with Chris and Chris. Just as anyone who grew up as a fan of punk rock and ska in the 90s, I was very excited for that episode, and I wasn't one bit let down by those guys. Not at all. They, uh, You can tell they've been in a band together for uh, going on 40 years. They were just uh, busting each other's balls and having, having a lot of fun with it, and it was just a... I don't know. It was just a really relaxing, just fun conversation with a couple of of my friends. I I really tried to my best. I think I did to hold back. I I, I still look at these guys as as my heroes. Uh, they always will be. I, I I loved them before I ever got to meet them, and and just to be able to call them friends is is just to me. It's just it's so cool to this day to still feel that way. I'll never forget. It was early two thousands. Joe had. Uh, started another band called Avoid One Thing, and they had a, a couple gigs on the East Coast of the Warp Tour. And I went up to Joe. I saw him backstage, and I come on. I said, "Hey, Joe, it's Chris and Les and Jake." And he looked at me. He says, "Will you stop saying that? I know who you are." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, awesome. I'll, I'll never forget that. I just uh, just made me feel so good that uh, you know the the guy I looked up to for so long uh, knows, knows who the hell I am. It took everything in me to not sort of. I don't know what you want to call it, fanboy to them <laughs> when we were setting up and when you were finished. I just did it real professionally. I'm the producer of Krista Makes a Podcast. It didn't say, <laughs> yo, I'm in this band Punchline. You're like a huge influence. I, you know, I said this to you before you started, but the impression that I get hit like right when I was, you don't have in your notes like what time of year it was that that song came out or like when it was a hit. Right? I do, well, I do, yeah. Well, the record was released on March eleventh, ninety seven, and this would have been probably January or February. It was probably six weeks before the album dropped that the single was released. So probably February ninety seven. Okay, so it was probably like the summer between my junior and senior years of high school that this song was at its peak and you just heard it nonstop everywhere you went. It was in Clueless. It was on the radio. And on top of that, despite the fact that I was a punk rock fan, I still like this song and I still like this album. And it just goes along what, with what you were saying in a way is like, yeah, this song blew up, but it was still true to their sound. It wasn't like it was some new sound. It was the Mighty Mighty Boston's at their very best uh, firing on all cylinders. And 
I loved it and still love it. You know, I first got into the Boston's. I think it was the Don't Know How to Party album from like 93. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first album that got me into the Boston's. But yeah, just a legendary band. Yeah, there used to be uh, this thing at, it was at the Wrights Union, which was the campus center at the University of Florida. And uh, the ballroom at the Wrights Union used to hold shows. And I saw the Boston's there. And it was life changing. This was in, I believe, late 91 or early of 92. They had just put out uh, their second record, More Noise and Other Disturbances. And I just was, I had never seen a band with this kind of energy. It was uh, unlike anything I had seen. And I just remember saying to myself, I want to do that. That looks like the right. best fun I could ever think. This is like a party <laughs> every night. It's just amazing. Yeah, you think about their catalog, and it's one of those bands, once you start looking at like all the songs, they're just so awesome. <laughs> I I sometimes, it's not that I forget, but I just look like, dude, that song, Kinder Words. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which is the first the first track on Question the Answers, yep. right? Mm -hmm. that is just such, when that song kicks in, it is just such a jam. Yeah, Don't Know How to Party is amazing. Uh, that song, Toxic Toast, uh -huh. <laughs> you know that song? What that is just like such an incredible chorus in that song. Uh, someday I suppose is such a jam. Yeah, which I think is someday I suppose is that the song that you mentioned? It was kind of the precursor to. Yeah, that yeah. was that was just a really commercial sounding. I, I you know I uh, shudder to use the word mature, but it was a step up in their songwriting. It was just the next level uh, for those guys. You know, it wasn't really hardcore or or too ska. It was it kind of straddled the middle in this pop territory that that I felt was kind of the precursor to impression. Right. I feel like Dicky was very self deprecating, and it's funny, and it's it's a humble way to be but i feel like there are a lot of songs before let's face it that were well written songs i mean i haven't broken them down and analyzed them but i feel like there's a lot of songs with huge choruses and maybe they weren't written in that standard pop format for the radio or something but i feel like if they weren't they were damn close well, and Dickie's gotten, I mean, uh, tenfold better as a vocalist over the years. You, know, you got to remember, this guy started out as a hardcore singer in Boston. That's the scene that he came from. You know, and all of a sudden he gets in this band that, you know, that they had a record called Ska Core, The Devil and More. I think they might have even came up with that term, Ska Core. That's what they were. They were a hardcore band at first that mixed Ska elements in and they had a horn section. So, you know, here was this guy screaming his head off that they're like, uh, hey, let's try to sing. And it was like, right. you know, so when he's self deprecating, it's, it's just, where he came from he was a hardcore singer that was that was told to sing and he's he's really uh really come into his own over the years he's very humble about his own voice and i think that comes off you know it's charming and it's funny but dicky if you're listening to the rap right now your voice is awesome there's so much character in dicky's voice nobody it's, sounds like him <laughs> no nobody sounds like him it's iconic i would take dicky's voice over 99% of classically trained singers. It's just got so much character. It's so cool. And it just, you couldn't find a better voice to match the music of the Mighty Mighty Boston's. I think it's really Not at funny. All. <laughs> it's funny. You're talking about the scream in uh, the impression that I get, which I've never really thought about that. That's such an awesome way to lead into a chorus. It's so cool uh, from yeah, a songwriting and, and perspective. For sure, and it's so boss tones. It's like, yeah, you've done that a bunch of times. I, it was almost odd to hear him talk about that it was like this novelty thing in this song. I'm like, wait a second, you're known for screaming, you know? It was <laughs> yeah. interesting how, how he was putting it. And I just have to say, you know, not to not to gush anymore about this band, but, you know, Less Than Jake, these guys were the blueprint for what we did. They played every crappy club around the United States umpteen times before we ever came along. And they paved the way. They gave bands like us a chance. And we looked up to them. And, and like I said, when this song hit, I couldn't have been more proud. There wasn't a, a speck of jealousy or, or, or you know envy in me. It was just like, these guys did it. And they deserved it. They had been pounding the pavement for over a decade. And it was, it was awesome to see this song blow up. <laughs> One more funny thing about Dickie's voice before I move on to the next thing I want to say is I love that he referred to it as Dickie's monster voice. <laughs> 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 also you know when you're talking about laying the blueprint for less than jake not only as 
you know, in the the same world of music and style, but also the live show. You know, Less Than Jake is a band I always think about. It's like this this crazy, energetic, fun live show. Well, yeah, the Boston's are that too. I mean, there, there's a guy in the band whose job is it just to dance. Yeah, <laughs> That's they, how they yeah. um we took a page out of their book for sure. It was like they're the most fun band in the world. We want to be a fun band, and they're one of those bands that you don't have to know the songs. You just go to the show, and you're gonna have you're gonna have a good time and i thought it was important to mention their new single and why i wanted to discuss it at the end of end of the show just due to the fact that i just the you know they talked about tim armstrong wanting it to be a 15 minute song i couldn't believe it was eight minutes (laughs) and that they put this out as the first single and i used the word a couple times ambitious i can't think of a better word to to describe the final parade and it's i think it's cool of them to still be giving back after all these years they're still giving back to those bands that that grew up with them and looked up to them and still keeping our name out there uh, on their behalf which i think is really cool yeah it's awesome that's a real who's who of ska and punk rock music the one other thing i I wanted to touch on real quick which i i think is funny this goes back to the impression that i get is you brought up i had never heard the rumor that the song was about abortion or anything like that but i did and it's funny dickie i hadn't thought about it in a few years but then dickie's the one who brought it up i did hear that the song was about an, an aids test and then when you look at all the lyrics and you think about like the theme of the song it can totally relate to that and like they kind of alluded to Dickie and, and Joe alluded to that a, a song you can take away whatever you want to take away from it if that's what it means to you then that that's great because it you you could either either one of those interpretations which weren't necessarily what it was written about but you could interpret it that way and I think that's what's great about a great song is to be able to take your own meaning from it and, and uh that, that makes the song that much more special to you if you can make it personal, you know? For sure, and I, I completely related to what Dickie said with that. I've had fans come up and say, this song, it means this, right? And it's just like, well, no, but I'm not going to tell you it doesn't mean that. If that's what right. it means to you, then all the more power to you. It makes me feel great. And you know what makes me feel great, Chris? What is that? Giving back via our forwarding domain of com, where everyone can go to check out this month's fundraiser. That's right. Every month we do a fundraiser here at Krista Makes a Podcast, and for the month of March, we got the Superhero Center for Autism, which is a nonprofit organization offering support, education, and resources for individuals with autism and other special needs and their families. They have opened a community center in the Rockford, Illinois area where kids with special needs can just be. Be safe. Be empowered, be supported, and be themselves. This is a judgment-free place open to all kids with special needs and their families. What a wonderful fundraiser this month. Head over to KristaMakesADifference.com. Uh, any donation is accepted and much appreciated. If you got a buck or two or five or ten, the Superhero Center for Autism is a great place to send that. And you can easily do that by going to Chris to makes a Difference. Dot com. It's as easy as that, man. Absolutely. And uh, some, some other news that came across uh, our desk since we, we recorded the Boston's episode, Chris. Yeah, man. In the few weeks it's been since we recorded this episode with Dickie and Joe, the Boston's have actually announced that the new album comes out on May 7th. It's called When God Was Great. And all the pre-sale information and everything like that is available at bostonsmusic.com. I personally have a small, tasteful record collection, and I will definitely be adding this record record to that i'm on uh, on the same page as you there chris definitely interested in hearing the new record and it was such a pleasure talking to those guys i'm really pumped for it uh something else a lot of you have been asking about is how to advertise on chris to makes a podcast and uh, if you'd like to shoot an email to advertising at sound talent we can get you all the information for that once again that's advertising at sound talent uh, would love to, to have you uh, pitch whatever you'd like on your show whatever your business you think that uh, our listeners would be interested in hit us up and we will take care of you and uh, if you could follow me on instagram at less than chris d i uh, would love to uh, to have you be one of my followers and i promise to take good care of you and i want to thank dicky barrett and joe gittleman for being this week's guest it was another awesome episode and we'll see you next week Hey everybody, I'm Chris Fafalius and I'm the producer of Chris to Makes a Podcast and the host of the One Hit Thunder Podcast. And I'm Matt Kelly, host of Horror Movie Night and the producer slash the head of content for the Geekscape Podcasting Network. Between the two of us, we have, believe it or not, 25 years of podcasting experience and we want to help you start your own podcast. 
We know podcasting and we want to share that knowledge with you. So whether you're new to podcasting or you want some feedback on your currently active podcast, we want to help. Or perhaps you're just overwhelmed with all of the editing work. Well, we can help you with that also. You can contact us at info at weknowpodcasting.com for more information. We're excited to help your podcasting dreams become a reality. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place. The sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at two designers walk into a bar.com. And listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Hey there, I am Johnny Christ from Avenge Sevenfold, and I've got a podcast called Drinks with Johnny you're going to want to check out. I sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life, from professional wrestlers to actors, comedians, fighters, musicians, everything in between. I'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it. So if that sounds like something you're into, go check out Drinks with Johnny, streaming everywhere now.